welcome you to today's webinar. I know that everyone is busy and it's not always easy to get the time away from your work. I'd like to just um, bring forth to the disclaimer that I had on the first slide that I am by no means an expert on privacy and security. There is the RNAO or Ontario Web MP, and the whole intent of this webinar is actually just to simulate conversation and to everyone think a little bit more about the privacy and security of your own um, practice when using electronic medical records. Objectives um, for today is just looking at, um, at the privacy and security approaches that apply to the Personal Health Information Protection Act and your own practice uh, stand when you're working with an electronic medical record. So I think it's really important then that we understand the patient's individual rights and what the responsibilities are of the provider. I'd like to give you some tips for your own practice, and we'll introduce resources that are available. I think that health information is really a unique type of information. You know, on one hand, it is extremely sensitive, and it requires the strongest um, privacy and security protections we can provide so that unauthorized people aren't um, using it or disclosing in the information. But on the other hand, we have to be able to share it with a, you know, a range of healthcare providers so that we can provide quality care to individuals. I think that um, the electronic system really have their own distinct risk to privacy and security of personal health information. I mean, if you think about it, at the press of a key, you know, people have access to a huge volume of information from a variety of sources. And you can see if it gets scans of people who may be a little on the malicious side, it, it could um, cause some harm. The good news is, though, that with careful consideration with uh, um, the EMR, um, electronic systems that contain our personal health information can design and implement it in a manner that really addresses these risks. So with the use of encryption access controls, we've got audit logs and other tools that improve the privacy and security, uh, all this can be achieved for the electronic record. Uh, but during the privacy and security safeguards, um, built into the new information since so what it does is it really ensures that each of us are meeting our standards of practice. The and security obligations with an EMR are really similar to that of a paper chart. The EMR offers a mix of security needed to keep the patient health information secure, but it also brings with it uh, uh, new responsibilities that we have to be mindful of. Electronic format now is a little easier to transfer, you know, just with the use of flash drives, of laptops, um, hardware and devices need to be secure, and any transfer of our information needs to be encrypted. So ensuring that the privacy and security of health information with an EMR is a key component to building the trust required to realize the potential benefits of electronic health information. I think when we first went to the electronic information, you know, it, it does create a little bit of fear. And if our clients or our patients don't have that trust that we're handling that information accurately, then there's this perception that their information could be at risk. And it is the law. We reduced with some really basic tools and practices. So just like to um, read that now. Oh. 
I think the um, key up here is to realize um, that we all have a duty to share in the responsibilities that um, we have control of the um, personal health information. The um, Personal Health Information Act does require that uh, all health information custodians, we take control and we have reasonable steps in making sure that our clients' records are protected against theft, they're protected against loss, or any unauthorized use of, um, of it. And the information is protected against any copying or modified in any way, or that it's disposed of accurately. Custodians must all make sure that the records with the public, um, the health information, is obtained and transferred and disposed of in a very secure manner. So briefly, the Personal Health Information Protection Act is a legislation that balances your client's rights to the privacy with the need of individuals and organizations. So it um, it provides the health care and access that sharing of information is is um, done accurate. And this is what it does. It permits that sharing of personal health information amongst the team just so that we can facilitate efficient and effective care. So we need to look at the responsibilities of what the organization has that you work for. So it does require that the health information custodians identify who the privacy contact person is. So you should know who that is in your organization. That person should be knowledgeable and educated about the practices obligation under PPEA. So one of the responsibilities is there should be policies. There should be both written and formal privacy policies public signage, so it should be posted somewhere in the office so that the patients know that we do follow the Privacy Act. Um, they would deter the compliance, investigate any breaches. They have the responsibility to make sure that staff are educated and aware of the policies, and they need to confirm that there's an understanding and agreement with third parties to comply with any privacy and security requirements. Another thing is to make sure the work environment is adapted to protect health information. Uh, for example, just while you're using the EMR, uh, just the placement of your own computer. Uh, I know just offense to where the patient may sit so that they're not able to read the screen. Um, all providers have a standard of practice that they follow. And I know in our work environment, I've consulted, um, you know, we just kind of discuss with the social worker and dietitian. We all have standards of practice that we follow. Of course, being a registered nurse, I'm a little more familiar with my own scope. But just looking at consent, um, you know, consent to use information that you gather from patients is to provide care, and it can be assumed that you do have the care. How consent, sorry. Other thing is with documentation, the security of the record, safeguarding the health information by acting in accordance with the legislation and your own standard of practice. All NIFs are healthcare providers. We follow um, a code of ethics. We stand how we're accountable and, you know, just not leaving spaces in your um, documentation, even in the electronic format. 
Uh, I think also accountability is important when you uh, sign in using your own page and not uh, maybe document documenting under the doctor's page. Uh, security. Um, uh, electronic system is down. Uh, you may have to document in other format, making sure that you get the format on the, uh, the paper in the electronic record to right away. And I, I just wanted to bring that up. Just be mindful of your own standard of practice. To apply the Papilla to your practice. Now, it, it is your practice that is responsible for taking the steps needed. Uh, make sure that you understand uh, how to protect the confidentiality and the integrity of the health information in your EMR, comply with the PAPIA and the CNO standards. And any of these safeguards, when they're applied well, can help you avoid um, some of the common security gaps that could lead to data loss or a cyber attack. Um, they can protect your, the people, the information, the technology, and the organization that you may depend on to carry out your primary mission, and that's really just to help your patients. One with the PAPIA is that it also requires um, this to implement security measures which protect the patient's privacy by creating certain conditions for the uh, information to be available and not to be improperly used or disclosed. Extra precautions, though, are really needed for passwords so that you have um, access to the system and security of sensitive material. Our organization has defined transitioning from the paper to the EMR a little more challenging. Uh, it uh, it needs a little more thought in doing that process to ensure that confidentiality was maintained at all times. So one thing that uh, we did in our practice is make sure that the staff were trained well. Uh, the executive director at that time could see that if her staff wasn't trained, that there could be a chance of more human error. So that is something they took very seriously um, here in my workplace. Another um, area that we needed to think about closely was that the system may not be fully functional, so the EMR for all the security and privacy. So um, we had to make sure that all the features were turned on and, and be really well aware of that. Another um, thought that came into play when we were transitioning is just the realization that there was more people accessing the records than usual because we were had paper trail and we had electronic trail, so there was more people involved in that transition. And lastly, um, making sure that getting of the uh, trail was done according to the security measures and done uh, properly to uh, maintain privacy and security of all our records. So, that, but what um, I could mention here is Ontario MD. If in here is transitioning into EMR, they have some excellent resources. So you can tag there. In practice, maintaining uh, the privacy and security is uh, what we have done is restrict access to staff. So access to page records are on a need-to-know basis for the care to um, carry out the job functions that need to be done by that particular person. Uh, I'll tell you how tight they are here over privacy and security in our workplace is that when the nurses first joined the family health team, uh, we were limited even to access. So it's something that um, 
grown here, and the privacy is certainly taken uh, very seriously. We have an audit trail, and I know they're available on all EMRs, so we can do audits to record um, user access. Uh, we also uh, have allowance for correction or a, amendment of any information if the demographics were wrong. Now, if you accidentally charted on the wrong patient, then we have a place where we can append the correction and make that note in the patient's charts. We also, and I think this is really important, and it's important for our practice in a rural uh, town, is we have the ability to mask or unmask sensitive data. And by that, what I mean is uh, if you were seeing, say, our social worker over a sensitive nurse, she has the ability to be able to mark that as sensitive and limit any access into that patient's chart. IDs and passwords are really important, um, making sure that uh, your words aren't just dictionary, but they do have uh, bursts in them and um, there's and different, to, you know, like an exclamation mark. The automatic log off feature is important. I certainly think if you have to leave the uh, room and you don't want your patient sitting in your office chair looking at your features or your names on your page, so that this is a very good uh, feature. We have confidentiality disclaimers on all our printed reports. I am not familiar with our backup and our recovery procedures, but I do know that uh, privacy and our executive director has a robust backup here, and we have recovery procedures. So uh, one thing that I've come across is just making sure that you log in using your own unique password and ID and you're not logging in as somebody else. Um, protecting your password is really important. Um, for the confidentiality of your patients, ensure that you learn how to use the feature on your EMR so that you can either hide the list of your client names on your day sheet if your um, the screen is unattended. Let's save your documentation correctly is really important. Nothing worse, and I think uh, this was uh, something that when we first started using the EMR, somebody would go, oh, it's gone, it's gone, and we couldn't find it. And, you know, you have to check mark or whatever it is. But um, learning how to do that is really important. Exiting um, the public information that you don't require to perform your duties is considered a breach of confidentiality. So if you and it does meet with the standard of practice. If you don't need to be in somebody's chart, don't go there. If accidentally you open somebody's chart by mistake, uh, I would report it because um, the audit trade can be done. And may look then that you were accessing records that you didn't need to be into. Uh, some we're very strict about here in my practice setting is if we're sending emails in regard to patient care, we can send them directly in electronic medical record. As expected of us to attach any emails right to the patient's name and make sure that. Um, the patient is identified, and that note that you're sending to the doctor can also go right directly into the patient's chart from your EMR mail. What happens when a breach occurs? Well, if, if you think a breach has occurred in your practice, um, it certainly can be very violating to the client. Um, depending on the sensitivity of the information. I don't want to get a reputation out there that your organization or the work 
developers aren't careful about the information that they, and it certainly could compromise patient care and it puts patient safety at risk. Um, a brief very costly. You've got uh, legal fees, not to mention though the reputation. So a breach should be reported to your privacy officer in your organization as uh, healthcare providers. I challenge everyone to advocate for policies and procedures and to make sure that education is done in your facility. Reach the discussion, you know, talk about it amongst your um, colleagues. Uh, you just stimulate a respectful environment that honors confidentiality and privacy. List of resources here that I'd like to share with everyone. Now, anyone can contact Ontario MD. They have a wealth of information and lots of resources and toolkits on confidentiality when using the EMR, um, how to trans assist in the transition from paper to EMR. It's um, anywhere. It's a variety of people that could really um, help you. I have a discussion. Um, I just think about this little scenario. If you briefly leave your office and your computer screen is sitting on your workstation is on, she brings a patient into your office and back into the office, you realize the patient is reading your screen. So the breach of confidentiality? So I'm on your line, press star seven. What? Do you think this has been a breach of confidentiality? I guess it would really depend on what was on your screen when you left the office. Um, it, it it really is a risk to, um, even if it was just your patient's schedule, because usually the schedules do have some information around what the appointment is. Mm -hmm. so you have to be really, really careful to make sure that you um, don't have screen open. Exactly. And uh, this actually, you know, a situation that we're very careful about in our practice setting um, is making sure that the list of patients is not going on the screen. And there's different functions that you can do that. Um, uh, you know, do that discussion in your office and, and ask about it. Anyone else have any comments? There's your line. Um, if the patient was reading their own um, chart, would that be considered a breach of confidentiality? I consider that a breach if they're, but they'd have to ask permission. I um, come in and find a patient sitting in my chair looking at chart. Like I respect there and going through it with them together or providing them with the opportunity to look after it with permission. Can you help? Yeah, I can hear you, Connie. Okay. Did you hear my response? Um, yes, and then you just asked to, if there was any more questions. Yeah. 
Okay. And I'll just uh, carry on with helping. Uh, um, this is where helping advance the EMR use. So Ontario MD and RNAO have a collaborative peer leader program. Um, nurse um, peer leaders, and we have one senior nurse peer leader. It is the provincial component of the Canada Health Highway Canadian Clinical Peer Support Network Program. Initially, it was only physician and clinic miniature peer leaders, and they were looked at the EMR adoption and implementation access to information and resources online. So the whole goal was improving patient care and practice efficiency. It's free. The support program is available for primary care nurses and um, nurticianers, physicians, health professionals, and administrative staff. You can access us by person, by phone, or by webinar. Uh, the nurse peer leaders are also actively involved in Ontario MD working groups, their steering committees, and projects aimed at supporting EMR users. The peer leader provides opportunities for um, accessing some of the EMR resources available to you, sharing experiences and uh, best practices participating in on-site or webinar demos, and learning tips and, and tricks to uh, best optimize the EMR. Since so September through December, we have been offering primary, primary care EMR webinar series. You can register at the RNAO website. We have an uh, e-health community of practice with lead discussions on using uh, EMR and share best practice. If you'd like more information or you'd like to talk to a peer leader, uh, Tanya Costa at the RNAO would, be, uh, would welcome any conversations. Our number is attached here. Are there any other questions or comments? Unmute your line by pressing star seven. Alternatively, you can type in your question in the chat box on the WebEx um, screen. Well, there's no questions, but Connie, I just wanted to take this time to thank you very much for your presentation and all the great information you provided. Um, if there are any questions, um, feel free to email me and I can pass it along to Connie. Slides will be available. They will be posted on the RNAO website, um, the Communities of Practice, um, and if you need a, hard, or a copy of them, feel free to email myself. So, Thank you to Connie, and thank you to all the participants for um, attending today's webinar session. Thank you very much. Thanks.